Um, so we uh, are lucky to have her today to talk about her research. She comes to us from Northern Illinois, Elmhurst, uh, and she's been a chemistry major and then a biochemistry major. So it was she saw the light. Um, she's done, she, like many Lawrence students, she's done a pretty wide array of research. So she's worked uh, in biophysics with Dr. Martin as the, uh, you know, bringing chemistry to that uh, very physics oriented place. And then she's done organic chemistry research, particularly synthetic research uh, at the University of Cincinnati with Dr. Anna Cotton's daughter. I guess we're interested in talking about that today. So let's get Hi, uh, my name is Anna Rallis, and today I'm going to be talking to you guys about the research that I did at the University of Cincinnati this past summer. And the title of my talk is The Effects of Different Substituents on the Photoreactivity of Shift Faces. And this is kind of like a long title, so I'm going to break it down for you. So first off, what is photoreactivity? It is a chemical reaction initiated by the absorption of light. So light is energy, and it excites electrons, which could cause uh, the structure of a molecule to change. So an example of this is in the bottom right-hand corner, where we have a carbon double bond to another carbon, and then a hydroxyl group. And then when you shine light at it, it could change into a carbon with a single bond to another carbon, and then a double bond to the oxygen. So specifically in my research, we were looking at how a photoreaction could change the intermediates of a reaction, so the structures that form for the final product, the lifetime of these molecules, so um, how long they're gonna last in solution, and the energies that they contain. So some applications of uh, photochemistry and these photoreactions is skin cancer treatment therapies, uh, optogenetics, which is um, the use of light to control neurons in the brain and changing gene expression. So that's what this picture is depicting up here, this mouse um, with light in its head. And when you shine a specific wavelength of light, it could change um, targeted light sensitive proteins and overall change the gene expression. Um, it can change other plant and animal um, genes as well, and it has an effect with fluorescence imaging and sunscreens. So an example of this is if you have a sunscreen and put it on your skin, you're, you want it to be able to absorb a specific wavelength of UV light from the sun, and then you want it to either reflect or absorb that light um, without causing um, potential byproduct that would be harmful to the skin. So that would be another important thing to test. Also, photochemistry is very important because it's a type of green chemistry, so that just means there's less harmful waste and byproduct than other um, kinds of reactions. So two relevant photoreactions that I'm gonna be talking about are photoionization and photochromism. So first, photoionization is the formation of isomers via photoexcitation leading to the production of enols. So an enol can be seen in the upper corner up here, and it's a carbon double bond to another carbon, and then a hydroxyl group on it. And it produce, and in this reaction, it produces isomers. And what this means is that you have two different molecules that are comprised of the same elements, but they just have a different structure. So in this case, we have a cis and a trans enol. And all that means is that in this one, the hy hydroxyl group is there, whereas in the other one, it's over there. So the most important part of this reaction that we're looking at is this hydrogen exchange. So we have this ground state molecule, and then we are looking at, when you shine light at it, the hydrogen from this carbon is going to transfer to that oxygen. So the second relevant photoreaction that we're looking at is photochromism. And what this is, is the reversible transformation of a chemical between two forms by the absorption of light. So again, we have these cis and trans molecules down here. And we're looking at, if we shine a specific wavelength of light at it, 
Um, in this case, we're going to do nanometers. The cis version of the molecule can change to the trans by rotating 180 degrees around the double, uh, the double bond. And then you can shine another specific wavelength of light at the trans product to revert back to the cis. So you have this switch that goes back and forth. So now that I've talked a little bit about what photoreactivity is, uh, I want to show you the molecules that I'm specifically looking at, which are shift bases. And the important uh, characteristic of this type of molecule is that you have this carbon-nitrogen double bond. So this molecule in particular is one of the ones that I worked with, and it's unique because it has this aromatic ring attached to it that hasn't been studied as much um, from other research groups. So uh, shift bases were discovered, or found by Hugo Schiff, and biologically, they are formed during glycolysis and the metabolism of amino acids. So again, the, uh, the goal of my research was to uh, find the different effects of substituents on the photoreactivity of these bases. So basically what that means is if you shine light at our molecule, what happens? So we wanted to look at how different substituents change this. So basically what groups added to the aromatic ring will change um, the characteristics. So we have a methoxy group, chain of carbons, nitrogen, chlorines, and even add another aromatic ring. And this can change the size, shape, and availability of the electrons, which can overall change the lifetimes and energies of these molecules. So specifically, this is the molecule I'm going to talk about for the majority of the talk. Um, it was the first molecule that we synthesized, and it's the most simple because there's no other groups attached to the aromatic ring. And, um, it's important to note that we were studying the fundamentals of these molecules and just to test the lifetimes and energies um, so they could be used for uh, applications that I discussed earlier, like skin cancer treatment and sunscreens. So to study these molecules, I looked at two different methods, the first of which being the laser flash photolysis, or LFP, which finds the kinetic trace or the lifetime of the molecule along with the UV spectrum. And second, I looked at uh, computational predictions to determine um, what would be expected uh, for the photoreactivity. So it's important to note that LFP is the experimental data, whereas the computational predictions are just theoretical that we did on the computer to compare to our findings. So first off, what is laser flash photolysis? It's an excitation method um, of our material by using lasers. So what we're doing is we take a cubette and we dissolve our compound in a solvent, and in this case it's going to be solvent dependent, which I will address later. And we place our sample into the setup, the optical setup, and we have these two light sources. So first we have this xenon lamp, and it's a high intensity lamp that sends ultra fast um, pulses of light at our sample. So we can study the molecule under very short time scales, so under nanoseconds. And it provides an extremely high brightness over a long, um, like, uh, broad wavelengths. And then we also have this YAG laser that is used to excite the molecules enough that we can see data. Um, we used 308 nanometers of light, and um, from this laser, which is very powerful, um, so the one downside of this is that um, if once we use this laser, it degrades our sample, and so every time we want to do an experiment, we must make new samples and keep that stupid into the uh, LFP set. So once these lasers are going, our, it, um, the signal is amplified, it goes through the, the detector and other optical instruments so we can produce two different types of data. So the types that we get are the transient UV spectrum. So this is just like um, in 
chemistry 115 when you take the UV spectrum of something. So you're looking at the wavelength versus the absorbance. And in this example, you see that there is, a, in, there is an absorption around 350 nanometers. And what this means is that we should see an intermediate at that wavelength. So if we, uh, our second type of data that we can get is the kinetic trace. So that finds the lifetime of, of our intermediates. And this is looking specifically at 350 nanometers, but seeing how long it'll last, uh, that absorbance will last. So we have this is before any light is shown at our molecule, and then it becomes excited, and then we see how long it takes to get back to the ground state. So as I said before, this experiment is solvent dependent, so, or we believed it would be solvent dependent, so we tried it in two different um, types of solution, methanol and acetonitrile. So methanol likes, is able to donate hydrogen atoms, whereas acetonitrile uh, does not. So if we go back to the photoenolization reaction that I showed before, I was interested in seeing how this hydrogen transferred to the oxygen when you shone light at it. So this means that if you have our solution, our molecule in methanol, it can obtain this, the hydrogen that we're looking at from its surroundings. This can make the molecule short-lived and unstable because it'll change the charge and make have an extra positive charge, so it will have a shorter lifetime. Whereas in acetonitrile, there's no hydrogen in the surroundings, so it must come intermolecularly from the nitrogen. This makes it more stable and has a longer lifetime. So this is the first set of data that uh, I collected. It's the transient UV that I discussed before. So again, we have the wavelength versus the absorbance in methanol and acetonitrile. And there's four different lines on each graph, but this is only depicting um, the different speeds at which the laser um, is flashing. So it's looking at that time scale. So in both samples, we see that we have a peak around uh, 400 to 450 nanometers. And it looks as though that there's going to be a peak um, just under 300 nanometers as well. We weren't able to collect data much lower than that, but since we have this upward trend, we believe that something's going to be happening at that short of a wavelength. So this is good. This means that we have some kind of intermediate in our solution, and now we just need to figure out what that is. So the next test that we did looked at the kinetic trace in lifetimes, like I discussed before. And we believe that these cis and trans product were present. So we took the lifetime, we looked at the time versus the absorbance. And if you look at the red line, that is just with our solvent um, in the LFP uh, configuration, and we found what the lifetime would be. Then for the other lines on the graph, we added different amounts of base. And base is a hydrogen donor. So we believe that if we had both of these solutions, both of these compounds in solution, that the cis version would quickly revert back to the final product because this hydrogen could easily jump back to the oxygen. Whereas in the trans version, the hydrogen's way over here and wouldn't very easily be able to get back to the oxygen by like jumping over. Um, just uh, spatially, it would be very difficult. So if we added different amounts of base to the solution, a hydrogen would be able to attach to that oxygen, and the hydrogen would be able to leave from the nitrogen, going back to the final product. So this is exactly what we saw. Once we added base to the solution, the lifetime um, became much smaller. So we were able to deduce that the trans product was in solution. So again, the lifetime decreases with increasing amounts of base. So the second type of data that we looked at was computational predictions. And we used the computer program Gaussian D5. And what this does is you can draw out the molecules that you want to look at. So this is our original molecule, and this is 
We threw out our modules to the ground state, sold one core by radical, and sent a trans version of the molecule. And it optimizes the length between each uh, molecule and its overall 3D configuration. So uh, it can also help us predict uh, what type of absorbance we would think to see. So this is exactly like the data I showed before about with the, um, the peaks. And it's, so it's looking at the wavelength versus the absorbance in methanol and acetonitrile. And each colored line represents one of the intermediates that we believe is present. And if we circle the areas where we collected data and saw peaks, that it makes sense. We have peaks between 400 and 450 nanometers and under 300. So this is good. That means that the data that we took makes sense compared to theoretically what should happen. So from all this data, we made a proposed mechanism of what we thought was happening. We have our ground state molecule, and we shine light at, at it, and it creates, it goes into the singlet and triplet state. Um, I haven't addressed this yet before, but we believe that this uh, would happen first. It would, um, in the singlet and triplet states, that just means how the electrons, uh, what their configuration is. And it'll, be, it'll last a very, short amount of time, so even the LFP would be able to pick it up. So then we go to the one four by radical, and this is where the hydrogen moves. And then it would go to the cis and transform of our molecule, and then shift back to the uh, original product. So finally, we wanted to look at um, the rotation between these cis and trans molecules to see if it would be possible um, for it that reaction to occur in solution. And this goes back to the photochromism reaction that I talked about before, where you shine a specific wavelength of light, and one of the isomers will turn into the other, and then vice versa. So we wanted to test if this would actually be possible. So through our calculations, so this graph is showing that uh, angle at which our molecule is changing versus how much energy that would take. The molecule down here is the cis version, and here is the trans because it's rotating 180 degrees, and then um, it's showing going back from trans to cis from 180 to 360 degrees. And what we see is that theoretically it would take about 400 or about 14.4 kilocals per mole, which is a pretty high number. So we thought this would probably be on. So from all this data, we're also able to take uh, or find out what the most stable energy would be for each molecule. So this is, again is just going through the mechanism, only incorporating the energies associated with each molecule. So here we have our base uh, at the ground level, and then the singlet state, the triplet state. And then it has a transition state barrier, so it just needs a little bit of energy for the rest of the reaction to occur. So we have the 1,4 bi radical and then the trans and cis products. And it's important to note that this cis product has a much lower energy state. It's a lot more stable than the trans. And since experimentally we found the trans um, molecule in solution, it would be likely that the cis is also present because it, it is much more stable in solution than trans. So again, going back, uh, we synthesized seven different molecules, and I specifically talked about this one. But I can summarize the data that we found about all of them. So it's important to note first that I divided up the data with this red line. Um, the bottom two were the molecules that had the aromatic rings, and the top data had awkward uh, ones without. And what we were able to conclude was that the molecules with both aromatic rings seem to last a lot longer in solution and were a lot more stable. So we believed that this could, uh, that the aromatic rings provide more stability, giving them a longer lifetime. We also concluded that um, there was that solvent dependence that I mentioned earlier, that in methanol, the lifetimes were much shorter than in acetonitrile, 
because of that intermolecular um, hydrogen exchange or getting hydrogen from its surroundings. And then finally, we were looking at this transition state barrier that I mentioned um, in the overall mechanism, so the energy for the reaction to occur. And we saw that as you as you increase that transition state barrier, that the lifetimes also increase. And this makes sense because if a molecule needs more energy and it is more stable, then it should have the longer lifetime. So what have we found about shit bases and their photoreactivity? So some of the conclusions we can make um, first, from our LFP data, that it confirms that intermediates were formed, that some kind of reaction occurred. We established the formation of the trans um, intermediate by using base. We also saw that the solvents have a significant impact, that um, methanol is much shorter lived than in acetonitrile. Um, we also did all of the tests that I showed with LFP and computational with all the molecules I used, and they all showed the same overall mechanism, and that we saw that the compounds with two aromatic rings had a much longer lifetime. And then from our calculations, we saw that um, the UV viz data matched what we actually collected, and then we also uh, determined that the cis molecule was more stable than the trans, so it's most likely that both are in our solution. And finally, when the transition state barrier decreased, we also saw the lifetime decrease. So future goals that my lab wanted to look at um, after the summer was to carry out um, the solid state LFP, just so to see if our solution as a crystal would have different energies um, or just different photoreactivity. Um, look at adding different functional groups to other parts of the aromatic ring to see if that had any difference and to test other compounds. Um, overall, this can be applied to a lot of the applications that I discussed earlier. Um, like I was talking about with sunscreens, if we have molecules that have longer lifetimes, they'll be able to protect your skin for longer, which would be helpful for everyone. So looking at future applications for all of these fundamental So I would like to thank um, a few people for all of this, um, especially the two professors that I worked with this summer, Professor Anna Goodman's daughter and Dr. Michael Baldwin. Um, also the two grad students that I spent most of my time with, um, Kitika and Jennifer. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Dave for helping me through uh, working out a lot of this PowerPoint and um, the Lawrence University Chemistry Department. They helped me out a lot figuring out this presentation and how to present. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, the NSF and RU for funding this research. Yeah. values. 
this one. So what does the peak mean at that, like, did you guys, did you ever talk about what that peak that you did, that didn't fall under the experimental curve? Um, well, so we were just seeing if those were like present at um, specific wavelengths. So although those weren't necessarily, like, are you talking about like yeah. this one? Yeah. Um, it's not within like 400 to 450, but those intermediates are present under 300. Mm -hmm. So we think that they could be present here and not necessarily up there. So we know that they could still be present, but maybe not at the 400 to 450. Mm -hmm. so What sodium is in the free base? I think that was just what was chosen. Well, I'm not sure if there was a specific reasoning for using that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that was my question as well, because in intraorganic, you learn that that's a non -nucleophile. That's a nucleophile, but not a base. But it's a weak base, right? Mm -hmm. In fact, it's quite weak, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Does the fact that that is acting as a base suggest that the acid-base chemistry is taking place on an excited state species because it's observed that photo-excited species have lower pKa's than their ground state analogs. Mm -hmm. So just that using, I, I just want to make sure I know what you're yeah. asking that. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I guess what I'm wondering is, is the fact that the sodium azide can be a functional base in this context mm -hmm an indication that the acid-base chemistry is taking place on a photo-excited compound because photo-excited compounds generally have lower pKa's yeah. than their ground state analogs. Yeah. yeah, I think that makes sense that that would be occurring, um, but um, I'm not sure if my research group has ever tried it with other bases or not, but I, I think that makes sense. Other questions? Let's thank the speaker again.